So as you know, we have lost one, one lecture because of uh, national holiday. So there are some things that are in the notes that I, I didn't have the time to explain, and I will not have the time to explain. But I don't know if you have had a look at, at, at the notes, and uh, in the treating of topological order, so we see that our excitations are string states. And so if I have a string state, and then I apply a loop operator, I can, as we said, I can deform this trajectory, right? And I, but I still have the same couple of excitations. So in particular, what I could do is to do a transformation in which I try to exchange the particle A with the particle B. So what do I do is that I do a string from A to B and I bring it here. And then this one from here to here and then bring it here. And the total, the net process, is that I have applied the loop onto the initial state. So if you do all the calculation, you see that you go back exactly to the same state. Not, not so surprising. You go back to exactly the same state. So what happens when we exchange two particles and we go get exactly to the same state? It means that it, these particles are bosons. So we know that these zeta 2 charges and, uh, and fermions, uh, charges and vortices, are bosons. However, these two things are mutual semions. What does it mean? That if you take two of them, something like this. Okay? So now this, this is a charge and this is a vortex. And you carry one of them around the other. So remember, these strings are x's and these strings are z. So you can see graphically, but you can do the, the calculation is in the notes, that they intersect at one point. So when I carry this particle around the other one, I get a minus one. And this is interesting. So this particle knows that there was a particle inside its path no matter the distance. You, you have already seen this effect in quantum field theory. What is it called? It's called the Aronoff bomb. When you, when you carry a charge around a magnetic flux, you get the same effect. So you don't need electromagnetism for this. The, any uh, local gauge theories like this, even for a simple group like Z2, a consequence of this, in gen and it's always like this, when you have pairs of mutual semions, now imagine that you can glue them. So you see, you think that you have new particles that are two, a charge and a vortex that are glued together. It's a composite particle, right? Like, like like in QCD. If now you do the calculation and exchange these two, and you do all the calculation, so the initial state is what it is, but, and then you do the swap, the exit state, what you get is minus the initial state. You get the phase minus. So this means that this particle is a fermion. So we see from a spin model, where everything is bosonic, everything commutes, we get localized fermions emergent. This is not like the fermions that you get from the jordan Wigner transformation in uh, uh, when you diagonalize the XY model, those are fermions uh, 
that are due to uh, you know, a, a long string operator. They are delocalized. These are localized fermions. They are emergent. And in the same way you can uh, make emerge from more complicated lattice gauge theories anything you want, any particle, even uh, photons, which I mentioned once. Okay, I don't have the time to enter the details of this. <coughs> but you find everything in the notes. <coughs> so the, this lecture and the next one <coughs> are about the fundamental fact of nature. What is the fundamental fact of nature? It's this one. So let me read this for you. Tapsiukra theretai, thermonsuketai, eugrona winetai, carfaleo notisetai. So this was written as a poem by Heraclitus uh, 2,500 more plus years ago. And it means uh, the cold things become warm. And what is warm cools down. What is damp dries out. And what is dry moistens. This is the fundamental fact of nature. We have changed all our laws of physics. We have changed even the notions of our laws of physics. We have changed the idea about what is matter, what is energy what is space, what is time, but we have never changed this fact, that things can be found away from equilibrium, but they tend to reach equilibrium. If something is warm, it will cool down, and if it's too cold, it will warm up. And this is the only law of physics that has never been changed. And uh, Sir Arthur Reddington said, uh, there is only, you know, one, one article of faith in physics, and there is only one thing that you are better off not try to question in your activity as a scientist, and it's the second principle of thermodynamics. So the goal of these two lectures, uh, two lectures is to show, to at least to, to sketch out how the second principle of thermodynamics, how equilibration can happen in, uh, in, in, quantum, in a quantum many-body system. And many, many bodies important. We really have no hope of showing thermodynamics, or at least this type of property of thermodynamics, in a system with few bodies. This is a very, very, very difficult task. And the main problem is that the second principle of thermodynamics, as you know, defines the arrow of time. You see, this, this is about a process. What is cold becomes warm. There is a before and a after. However, all the fundamental microscopic laws of physics are time reversal. So how is it possible to get from a fundamental time reverse, reversal law of physics something that is not time reversal? So this is the main problem of, in general, statistical mechanics, classical and quantum statistical mechanics. In quantum mechanics, we have additional problems due to the structure of quantum mechanics, namely that evolution is unitary. So let's start from this. So first fact, we are concerned with quantum mechanics in a closed quantum, uh, in a closed system. So you understand that when we are in an open system, the usual treatment that we do is that we have this huge buff that is supposed already to be at equilibrium. And we dump, we, we dump all, the inter, you know, all the information that we have in the small system in the, in the large system. 
and actually, so the microscopic equation of the motions that we use to model this process, they are not time reverse. So there is no, no question. We use a model called the master equation that is not time reverse. But then the question is, how did the bigger system reach thermal equilibrium? Right? And then either you solve the problem how the subsystem plus the bigger bath reach thermal equilibrium as a closed system, and then you have to use uh, normal quantum mechanics, or you have to put this big system in an even bigger system. And so on and so forth until you reach the whole universe, which by definition is closed. So we need to solve the problem quantum of how this is possible in a closed system. But in a closed system, we have a Hamiltonian, which is the generator of time evolution. which is unitary. <clears throat> and now I will show you that uh, equilibration is not possible under unitary evolution. So no equilibration. What do we mean about for this? So equilibration is a weaker property than thermalization. So eventually we are interested in thermalization. Equilibration just means that something that is away from equilibrium reaches equilibrium. Then a second problem is what type of equilibrium is that? If it's what we call thermal equilibrium, then it's thermalization. It could be uh, different types of equilibrium. For instance, it could be an equilibrium that remembers the initial condition. Thermalization doesn't. Why? Why thermalization does not remember the initial conditions? So this is something that we'll, we'll see. Okay? So equilibration is something weaker. It just, we just have something that is evolving. <coughs> And then equilibrates. This something could be the expectation value of an observable. <coughs> so let's show this. So what we want to show is the following thing, that if we have a psi of t, it's never the case that this thing is evolving in time. It's not you know, something that is already a steady state, but that eventually becomes steady. We want to show this, that this will not happen. So we want to show that this limit does not exist unless it's trivial. So what is the, the trivial case? Imagine this is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian then, of course, psi of t is equal to psi of t prime. It's equal to psi of 0. So it's a constant state, always. And therefore, its limit exists. But it's trivial, because this thing has, has been constant at all times. It has never evolved. It was already at equilibrium. So I really mean no equilibration, something that starts out away from equilibrium, it is evolving, and then equilibrates. So I want to show you that in quantum mechanics, the fundamental fact of nature is not possible, <laughs> which is, let's see. So imagine that it does exist, and let me call it a psi infinity, okay, this state. And then I am interested in computing the difference between psi of t and psi infinity. How different they are. So I do it in norm. Any norm. Well, the norm for the states. 
So notice, by the way, that if this limit exists, it's also a fixed point of the unitary evolution, right? What, I, what do I mean? That u t psi infinity must be psi infinity. Is it, is it obvious why? Remember that this is a, a, a group, right? So what I mean is that u t u s is equal to u t plus s. So by using this, you see that on the limit, nothing changes. OK, so because of this, because this is a fixed point, this can be written like just ut of psi 0 minus ut of psi infinity. <coughs> yeah? And then this is equal to the norm of ut of the difference between the two states because it's linear. But now we use it's unitary. So what we've learned of unitary operators with respect to norms, it's, they're norm preserving. So this is equal to the norm. So this is the fundamental fact. If this was not a unitary operator, now it would not be true. This is equal to psi 0 minus psi infinity. OK, so this is an identity. Now let's take the limit of this of this thing for t going to infinity everywhere. So because these are identities, also the limits will be the same. And let's look at the left side and the right hand side. Well, this does not depend on t. So it is itself. It is what it is. But this, in the limit of t going to infinity, is by definition 0. Because this is what I, I, I mean by psi infinity. It's, it's this in the large. So this is 0, which means that this is 0. So if psi infinity exists, it must be psi 0. So it's trivial. So this proves it. So no equilibration. <coughs> so are we done? <laughs> That's it? That's the end of the lecture? <laughs> no. <coughs> so we need to start thinking. So we made some effort in these lectures to Remind in different contexts that in quantum mechanics, what is physical is not the wave function, is the observables. <coughs> so maybe this is not true, but maybe the second possibility is that this is true. And unfortunately, no. Also, this is not possible. <coughs> In a closed system, the spectrum of every Hamiltonian in a specially closed system as a pure point spectrum means the spectrum is discrete. Okay? The gaps can be very small, but it's discrete. And if the spectrum of a Hamiltonian is discrete, for Norman proved, that the evolution is quasi-periodic. What it means, means that every expectation value of any observable, for every time t, there is a time t star in which the difference between the two values is arbitrarily small. Of course, t star can be very long, but it is quasi-periodic. So if a function is quasi-periodic, cannot have a limit. It's period, right? So this is also not possible. <coughs> so what, what else is left? What is left? There is only one other possibility left that is called equilibration in probability. <coughs> so 
So in words, it means this, that the probability that we observe a value away from equilibrium is small. And let me first draw a picture, then we will put it in formula. <coughs> Imagine, OK, this is time. This is the expectation value of the operator A. And let me get some reference value. that I will explain, let me call it A bar. Imagine our evolution goes like this. Let me get another color. <coughs> we start away from equilibrium. We os oscillate. And then we have something like this. Also, eventually, at very, very, very large time, phenomena has told us that this must be get closer, arbitrarily close to the initial value, right? Then from here, we probably have a similar evolution. So you see, this thing is quasi-periodic. It has never stopped, stopped evolving. It has never become this. However, its fluctuations from some reference value that I will call equilibrium value are small. You see, either they seem large, but not in the time domain, meaning the time during which they are large is very narrow, or like here, maybe they persist for some time but they're very, they're very small. So the probability of observing, eight, so in formula, if, if we have a profile like this, <coughs> the probability that A of t minus A bar is greater than some delta, this probability in a profile like this is small. And we call equilibration probability, if this goes to 0, as n goes to infinity. <coughs> so OK, they, you see, probability gives us this possibility. The state is always evolving, but we cannot observe it. The probability that we observe it is negligibly small. So th this is possible. So this is consistent with quantum mechanics, which doesn't mean that it happens. Right? In fact, I can produce many examples in which it, this doesn't happen. So very, very simple example. Imagine that your initial state is alpha psi 1 plus alpha beta psi 2, and your Hamiltonian is epsilon 1, the projector onto psi 1, plus epsilon 2, your projector onto psi 2, plus other terms. So you will see that with this initial condition in this Hamiltonian, my state will just oscillate between these two. And if I have any uh, observable, I mean, there are some observable, like for instance, this is an observable, right? the projection onto psi 1. Then this observable, so in white I write pi 1, will do something like this. <coughs> So the fact that this profile is possible doesn't mean that we have it. I just gave you a counterexample. <coughs> so <coughs> how do we go about this now? Now that we know that this process is possible, we 
use a second tool that is statistical. We want to say that this process is typical. That although now I just gave you a counterexample, these counterexamples are in some sense rare. And usually, so typically, we get this type of profiles. So we reach some equilibrium value. And moreover, the, this, this equilibrium value is thermal, which is an additional fact. And this happens typically. So now we need to understand better what we mean by typically. Typically in what sense? Okay. So what do I mean by these words, oh, this is rare and this is typical? <coughs> so to this end, <coughs> we need to develop some tools and show some facts. First of all, so this is very interesting. What is this A bar? So if there is an A bar such that this is true, what is it? Are we able already now to draw general inferences from this? Right now, you are, you, are the, the, you are able to answer this question. <clears throat> is A of T is almost always A bar? What is A bar? No, A, A of T is the expectation value. But, OK, OK. The expectation value, in, in what sense? Um, in the, in the um, so the expectation value in this sense? Yeah. No, but already this is the, so this is exactly what I mean. So this is psi of t, and a of t without the, the cap is, by definition, this. But you're right in, in another sense. Oh, it's, right. huh? Yes, time average is the expectation value in time. So I observe it at some point, and usually it's like that. So as being the expectation value in time, the expectation value must be the average, right? So A bar must be, <coughs> so this is completely general, the time average over a long time. Right over a long time, because it, it, if I restrict myself to the initial time domain where I still have many fluctuations, well, that counts a lot. But in order uh, to have that profile and say, oh, that is measure zero, means I have to observe over very long times. <coughs> So have you ever done this exercise? What, OK. What is the answer? What is, what is the result of this integration? <laughs> no, you have to speak louder because I'm deaf. I'm asking you <laughs> what happened after this. Uh huh. It's, so this is equal to some ensemble average. What, what ensemble average? Okay. So this is equal to the trace of a as an operator in in some state. What is this state? This state is. Let me write it like this. PM pi m, where pi m is the projector onto the m eigenstate 
of the Hamiltonian. So I'm writing H as Okay. And what is PM? PM is the probability that my initial state is in the M state. So in other words, it's the population of my initial state in the basis of the eigenstates of the Hamilton. This state, so it's, it's this state as a matrix. So I am in the basis of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. is a diagonal state like this. It's called completely defaced state. What does it mean? Let's write Psi 0 in the same basis. Let me write it here. Okay. PM is what we know. Psi 0 in the same basis. Can you help me? OK, it will have some off diagonal. So let me also let me write that this PM is is what we mean by uh, AM, the amplitudes in the basis of the Hamiltonian, right? The square of the amplitudes. OK, so can you tell me? Now I told you everything. I told, <laughs> so can you tell me what is the initial state? On the diagonal, we have the PN. On the diagonal, we have the P, PN. Yes? On your diagonal, we have alpha N, alpha N. Very good. Wow. On the off, off diagonals, we have this type of elements. And we are saying that our equilibration in probability is this process. So you see, this pro what does this process do? Just defaces the state. All the phase relations are destroyed. But it conserves the populations. So the only equilibration that is possible, equilibration probability, means that our observations are indistinguishable from this state. It is a, as if taking the initial state and just destroying the face. And now we immediately see something Two things that butter from two different sides and are both disturbing. The first thing is, you see, this is a pure state. We don't see it from this expression, but we know it was a pure state. Uh, but now this is diagonal, right? Now it's mixed. There is not a basis in which I can change these eigenvalues. So, and I have a 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. So the first disturbing thing is that from pure, we went to mixed, which is not possible because unitary evolution preserves purity. So it's not possible that the pure state becomes uh, a mixed state. So this is something that makes us doubt that equilibration or thermalization is happening. Uh, the second disturbing thing is that this equilibrium state so this, well, let me call it rho equilibrium, 
remembers the initial condition. It depends explicitly on the pi, pi that are the, initial, are the populations of the initial state. So how can this be a thermal state? Remember that thermal equilibrium means that all our expectation values only depend on one parameter that we call temperature. Which means that we, if we start from different states that are somehow labeled by the same temperature, whatever it means, so we have, we have one parameter that we can choose. But once we have chosen this parameter, they all must go to the same state, the same thermal state labeled by that temperature beta. So this is a process many to one. So I don't know where I came from. But these states may have a completely different populations. So one parameter does not fix the whole distribution of populations that is on the full Hilbert space. This is an exponentially large number of numbers. So it seems that the only equilibrium state that is conceivable can never be the thermal state. So the rest of, the, of our time will be devoted to showing that in spite of these two facts that seem like a very hard wall, actually uh, everything is fine somehow. I mean, that we can overcome these two problems. <coughs> huh? How did you actually calculate the exact temperature interval by interval zero to a to b to over one hundred? This is an exercise. Oh. It's quantum so mechanics one on one. It's not hard. Just do it. Just do the integral. And if you still have the BPI H T or something, that is constant and one of the Remember that this is fundamental. Probably you have already done this exercise without this, without, without the 1 over t, and use the lemma riemann lebesgue and showing that off diagonal elements go away. But in one hypothesis, you, you know, you say, oh, there are fast oscillations, they average to 0. This is what you do. Uh, but fast oscillations, to get that go to 0, means that uh, the spectrum must be continuous. So, or, or you cannot use the riemann lebesgue But we have a pure point spectrum. So uh, they don't go to 0 without averaging over t. So the fact that we have a pure point spectrum is fundamental. <coughs> In a closed system, there, there is a finitely discrete number of states. The universe has not a continuous spectrum. In writing this, are you also assuming helvetism? No. What's the difference then between, like it really looks like pan pan is equal to the next Like is that the point? The ergodicity doesn't mean, is something stronger. Doesn't mean that I can substitute the time average with the with some ensemble average. It means that I can substitute the time average with a particular ensemble average that is the one uh, is the is the ensemble average. Over in which all the states are equally represented. This is, you see, this is some ensemble average in a particular ensemble. So you're claiming this is true even if ergodicity is true? So this is always true. 
this is an identity. <coughs> so if you wish, ergodicity is needed to show that this is distribution is somehow like the Boltzmann distribution. It's the thermal one. But prima facie, it's not true. Right? This, this can be anything. In fact, it's exactly anything we want. It's the initial condition that we can fix. So we are, we are, we are back to this, this problem. So under which conditions we can overcome the fact that the state seems pure, I mean, should be pure, but, you know, this state looks mixed. And under which conditions we can overcome that, you know, that we remember the initial conditions. <coughs> so notice that Let me get some observable A. Let me pick A. For some of these observables, it could happen. So let me compute the expectation value of A in the state, in the real state that is time evolved at, the time, at any time t. So this is the real expectation value, according to quantum mechanics. Well, what we, when we say equilibration in probability, we are just saying that the probability that these two values are different, oh, sorry, A rho ec, We are saying that the probability that these two are greater, that th these are different, that this probability is small. This is what we just said. I I'm, I'm just rewriting what I said there. So A bar is the expectation value of A in the row, in state rho ec, is what I wrote here. And this is A of t, by definition of A of t. OK? So this is what I said. But now let's pick A, OK? It is possible that for some A, it, although these two states are different, rho, rho T, in fact, is pure, and rho ac is mixed, nonetheless, they give us a similar expectation value. Let's make an example. Imagine that we have these two states. So psi, psi of t, so the psi at the time t is given by ju just a system with two spins. <clears throat> and I compute the expectation value, uh, whereas psi ec is some mixed state that is one half up up plus one half down down. In fact, you can see that this is exactly the completely the defaced state from this one. And imagine I just compute sigma z1 in this state. In both cases, I find zero in both states. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is that it may happen that two observables have the same expectation value in two states that <clears throat> in principle are very different in, to the extent that one is pure and one can be very mixed. Because if this has to be the thermal expectation value, this has to be very mixed. <clears throat> this depends on A. Because 
if my A is this observable, the projector onto psi of t, then obviously the expectation value of this in here is 1, and here is 1 after, very different. Or it is what it is, 1 after, I think. Not 1. So it, it seems that it depends on the observable. <clears throat> so what are we learning? What we are learning is that, that sometimes it works. We, seem, we get lucky, and two observables give us the same expectation value, uh, no matter whether the state is pure or mixed. And some other times it doesn't work. So if we want to maintain our statement that uh, the probability of observing such expectation value of such difference is small, we are claiming that typically, again, it is like that. So that we are not just getting like that we get like all, all, almost always. The same thing goes for the point two. It could happen that two different sets of initial conditions, so P1, Pn, and P prime 1, and P prime n, when I measure the expectation value of my observable A, so let me call this rho and this rho prime, get the same value. So again, we would like to say, oh, this, we're not just getting lucky. This happens almost all the time. So this is our strategy. <clears throat> we want to show that these properties that in which we say we cannot say, you know, equilibration doesn't happen, it is because it doesn't happen always. This is what it means. However, it happens almost always. So this is the way up. So this is what we want to show. Um, I, I, I didn't understand why you wrote down that correct expression. Like, what kind of restriction are you imposing to the trace of a row with almost equal to the trace of a row prime? So right now, I'm not. Uh, imposing any restriction. What I'm saying is that it may happen, it may happen and that A does not see the difference between these two states. And I won't, and my claim is, and we will try to be precise about this, but the meaning is this happens always, almost always. Okay. So now it's the time to explain what it means, what it means to get lucky or not in quantum mechanics. Because you see, when we say typically, it means typically by uh, looking. So you see, this depends on the time, on the Hamiltonian, <clears throat> on what are the initial conditions, and on what observable we are picking. So we, when we say almost always, we are trying to say, no matter what state we pick, no matter what observable we pick, no matter at what time we look, statistically, almost always we get this result. <coughs> so in order to understand this, we need to understand what are the typical properties in the Hilbert space. Okay. So if I, give, if I pick a state in the Hilbert space, like our initial condition, typically how it behaves. <clears throat> and somehow when we understand this, we understand also what happens to Hamiltonians and uh, observables because th their typicality is related to the typicality of the states. 
fundamentally because the space of states and space of operators are dual to each other. <coughs> so what are the typical properties? Properties of a state. Okay. So we need to have what is the mathematical framework? And the mathematical framework is that we have our Hilbert space and we have some measure on it. And we already know what is this measure. It's the Haar measure. We talked about it. It's the unitary invariant measure on, on here. So we can pick some state randomly in a uniform way and then we can compute some expectation value on all these possible states of some of something, okay? Some some quantity Q. We could we'll call this quantity Q bar. So if there is a typical value for for Q, if there is a typical value, must be Q bar. It's the same argument than before. The typical value must be the average. But in order to say, like in my plot before, also this quantity has an expectation value, that is this one. But it's not typical. So if it's typical, it must be this, but not the other way around. In order to be typical, this must be small. So we want to show <clears throat> that the variance of that Q small also. <clears throat> the probability that we get a value that is not Q bar is small. So these are the two things that we want to show. So in particular, we want to show that if we take a pure state, when we look at it with some observable A, well, it looks like mixed. What do I mean it looks like mixed? That I can measure the expectation value of A in, in the pure state on, in some mixed state and get the same value. And this happens typically. Okay, so this is the first thing that we want to show. So we want to show that typically psi looks mixed when looked at with A. So what does it mean? Now, remember that our observables, t, no, not typical, no, not this word, but we are interested in observables that have a, a support. We are not interested in observables that are spread out on the whole Hilbert space, like the projector onto a state. The projector onto a state is not a good observable. It's an observable, but it's not a good observable, because in principle it's spread everywhere. We know that good observables are local. So the support of A is some HA. The, the, the some dimension, let me call it DA, is the dimension of HA. Is this clear? So we are introducing a tensor product structure in our Hilbert space, HA tensor HB, which is the rest, that is induced by the observable that we are using. This is the support of A. Of a. So now with this, what do we call the psi 
that is looked at with A, if I want to, for any A that has support on this, on this Hilbert space, it's what we call psi A, the marginal state. This is the meaning of the partial trace. So this is defined as the partial trace of a B of psi. And why it has the meaning that it has? Because the expectation value of A that has this support on psi, exercise that you should do once in your life, is equal to the expectation value of A in psi A. Just do it in a basis and you see it's true. So that's why the statistics of all the possible outcomes, of all the possible experiments on the Hilbert space A, HA, is represented by this state, the marginal state. We don't need the full state to, to get the same values. Very well. So what we are saying is that if we are measuring on A, so the, our expectation values are on A, which is what we mean psi looked at with A, we must consider psi A. But now, and this is the fundamental fact of quantum mechanics, the very fundamental fact of quantum mechanics, it is possible that psi is pure, but psi A is mixed. So that's why we can get the same expectation values of a mixed state. Because the effective state that gives us those expectation values is mixed. This is not a trivial fact at all. This is the defining property of quantum mechanics. That a pure state locally can be mixed. And this is what we call entanglement. Entanglement is precisely this fact. And you can read it in two ways. That a mixed state can be seen as a pure state on a larger Hilbert space, which is called purification. So this is only true in quantum mechanics. There is no other probabilistic theory that has this, uh, it has this property. If you try to build a probabilistic theory with this property, it becomes quantum mechanics. So people who study axiomatic or quantum mechanics have, have discovered this. And in fact, in my example here, this is exactly what happened. That psi of t locally looks the state one half spin up, one half spin down. Because it's entangled. So it locally looks mixed. So when I say that typically psi looks mixed on A, what I'm saying is that typically states are entangled. And not only they are entangled, but we need that they must be very entangled. Because this equilibrium expectation value if we want it to forget the initial conditions, we need a lot of entanglement. Why? So imagine that psi 1 is very entangled, psi 2 is very entangled, psi 3 is very entangled, psi 4 is very entangled. And then I look at them locally. But very entangled means that the the state reduced to A is the identity. It's the completely mixed state. Oh, but the completely mixed state is always the same. It's one. It's unique. So that's how we can get many to one. So our strategy is, if we show that typically the states in the Hilbert space locally are maximally mixed, or in other words, we show that typically states in the Hilbert space are maximally entangled, then we have 
uh, gotten a very important property of typicality in Hilbert space that can help us for all our foundations of quantum statistical mechanics. And th this proves what we do tomorrow. Questions? You want a very <laughs> entangled, a lot of entanglement between the subsystem A and subsystem B. Yes. Is that meant to somehow resolve it into a thermal state? Very good question. So, as you can see, we have a parameter, right, in the thermal states, temperature. Mm -hmm. So right now, I am picking all the states in the Hilbert space without any constraint with respect to what temperature they have, which we need to define what we mean for a pure state to have a temperature. But right now, we, are, we can take any state. So it means it can have any temperature, you know, it can have any energy in some sense. So we should expect that if this is going to give us the thermal state, should be the thermal state at infinite temperature. What is the tem thermal state in at infinite temperature? If you t take the Gibbs state and send beta to zero, you get this. So this is compatible with uh, the thermal state. Of course, when we want to get you know, a more sophisticated situation, because now we have a parameter, we do remember one initial condition, because it's the only quantity that is conserved by any Hamiltonian, that is energy. So we will not pick any initial state, but we will pick any initial state with some energy. And now we will not get the maximally mixed state. But if everything goes through, we will get the state that is most entangled, means most mixed, with this constraint. So the state that has the maximal entropy given an, one constraint. So the, how do you solve this problem? You, you know, you, do, you use a Lagrangian multiplier. You put the energy constraint, which is given by the Hamiltonian, as a Lagrangian multiplier. And what do you get? The Gibbs state. The Gibbs the definition of the Gibbs state. So this is the strategy. Can we see, can we see the, <clears throat> the temperature in the time average state? Because P1 to PM, they, they don't necessarily. They, they, yeah. so, they, they're not going to be time average with the time temperature. Yeah, so this is a good question. Uh, So for, for this initial con so this initial condition can be anything, right? We could have a superposition of states with de very different energies. So they don't have a, a defined temperature. So you will not be able to, to see temperature there. However, if this probability distribution has this form, so this is the probability distribution over the eigenstates, right, of the Hamilton. So let me pick some eigenvalue E star of corresponding to some eigenstate. If this probability distribution over these eigenstates has this form, so it's peaked around some value, we will have to show, so this defines a temperature. So this E star will define a temperature. Is it clear? I'm not, I'm not showing you yet how you do this. I mean, you, you can imagine how, right? So what is, this is the expectation value of the energy. So it is E star 
is the trace of the Hamiltonian onto our state. And we want to say that our state is thermal. So we want to say that this is compatible with some thermal state. So this value must be this value. So you see that you can solve for beta. So this is how E star fixes beta. So we will show that if you pick psi in a ball of states that have energy E star with some variance, narrow variance delta, then typically they are maximally entangled with this constraint, which means that they will be the Gibbs state. But with what parameter beta? Well, it must be this beta, since the expe this must be the expectation. Okay. 